Jesus Christ. What's the ratio of ratio in the ratio? <laughs> Yo, Dauk. What's up, people? Welcome back and a welcome to the Chill Zone. I am Jack, and today we are watching Seth's review. Can you wait for your audition for the uh, next Spider Man movie? You good? Alright. But no, today we are watching Seth's review of Endless Space 2, a game that I am sort of familiar with. Uh, I haven't played it, but a guy from our university's D&D club used to play that quite a bit, and he was not even an astrophysicist. Weird. But I've grown to appreciate it more, I, because I do own the art book for it. Don't ask me why. It's a long story. It involves a competition about who can make the best alien design, but it doesn't matter. For I've grown to like this game a lot more since I became a 40k fan, because there, you can do something that is even better than Exterminators. I'll explain later on if this gets brought up in the video. But without further ado, let's jump into review of the Jingoist Joy. Hey, hey, people. Seth here. Humanity. One day, we will inevitably reach the stars. And yeah, one we day, will. we will inevitably reach other intelligent, sentient, yet utterly alien races. We will shake their many appendages, engage in trade, exchange ideas, and even attempt diplomacy. <laughs> but we all know, inevitably, hmm. how this has to end. Since we are already looking at something nerdy, uh, a bit of facts. So the star that we just looked at right here looks rather blue, right? It's very light, it's not like our yellow sun. So you can assume that this one is a blue supergiant. That is, of course, if the planets are within some sort of uh, scale. Now, um, blue supergiants are about 20 times the sun. Uh, the sun size and solar masses as well. That's about 15 or so. The thing with these stars is that they are kind of like 80s rock stars. They live fast, die young. So they burn a hell of a lot of energy in comparison to, for example, something like Betelgeuse that is absolutely massive. Like, I think it's like 700 times the size of our sun, but like not that massive, only like 15. Um, what they do not have in size comparison to the red ones, the blue, have luminosity that's why they're so bright but also power like a thousand times the energy of our sun they are crazy Welcome to Endless Space 2. Endless Space 2 is <laughs> a 4X game, which, if you're not familiar with, stands for the four X's. Expand, explore, and exterminate all xenomorphs before they do the same to you. Mm -hmm. Probably, you know, most likely. I've played this turn-based sci-fi strategy intensely for the better part of a month. And before that, about two years. And I must confess, it's pretty damn good. Also, there is a story, and it is absolutely critical you understand the lore of this game. In the current job market, Endless Space Space historians are in extremely high demand and boast starting salaries of about 300k. Most of the Fortune 500 companies hire at least two of them in order to understand what the fuck is going on. The story is told to you through wiki articles, the accuracy of which is questionable because mm -hmm. I've uh, edited several articles and they still haven't caught me. In the universe of Endless Space <laughs> 1 and 2, there is or was an incredibly advanced civilization called the Endless. Wow. The Endless? Well, there's less of them. The end. Roll credits. But no, they went to space and they developed technology. They revolutionized the galaxy by creating dust. Dust is used as money in Endless Space 2, which it isn't. It's an autonomous cloud computing network of nanomachines that gets smarter as the cloud gets bigger. Nanomachines, son. Self-assembly, self-autonomy, and farming crypto tokens at rates never before seen in the known galaxy. However, oh, wow. they developed a little too hard when they figured out how to upload your soul. So half of them went on to live as immortal portal machines running on the 5G network these were known as the virtual and I want to make so many 40k references right now but I'm going to stop myself <laughs> okay and it's not even recording the audio fantastic 
Endless. The other half, known as the Concrete Endless, considered them an abomination because it's hard to consider a sentient laptop as intelligent life. Even harder when you find out it's still running Windows Vista. Unable to reconcile their differences, the Endless decided to end each other. The virtuals <laughs> unleashed bioweapons on the Concrete. The Concrete sent malware to their oh mailbox, God. forcing them to run 3 billion... <laughs> I swear. <laughs> the GIF of <laughs> the Asian guy flexing. Why? <laughs> instances of Bonzi Buddy. Needless to say, they wiped each other out. The Endless came to an end, but many centuries later, other races figured out space travel, picking apart the ashes and remains of a civilization long forgotten. In the galaxy of the Endless is where our story takes place. So, what do you do in Endless Space 2? Well, you pick a spacefaring civilization and you try to win. But what is victory? Victory can be anything. Money, technology, intergalactic conquest, or even Weaponizing the influence of e girl stream. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why did he? Why him? Gamers to absorb every sentient race in the galaxy. Because, as we already Noel. know, the sentient <laughs> oh brain is still capable of falling victim to becoming a simp. The path to victory is your True. own free choice. The game itself is very customizable, meaning there's no reason to pick any speed except fast, any galaxy besides Ovoid, and if anyone dares pick a custom race, we are all going to collectively form a non-aggression pact and hunt you down. Starting oh. off, you only have a single planet. Your home system is very modest, and you need to rapidly scale your operation oh, so you so to compete with the rest. I to do see. so, you'll need to explore, expand, and colonize new systems. Exploration is very simple. You send an exploration vessel into the great unknown and watch as it dies to pirates. Before Just like Mass happens, Effect. You'll want to find as many uncolonized systems as possible. On each planet, there's a chance of finding curiosities. These are the slow, pulsing rings you see on display. To explore a curiosity, you need to send a probe. It's quite similar to the probe minigame from Mass Effect 2. If mm. successful, the game will let you know, together with a small reward for finding it before anyone else. These can be anything from strategic or luxury resources, planetary anomalies, or even the start of a random quest line. The point of curiosities is to try and guess which star systems are worth colonizing. In general, any system <laughs> less than three planets is garbage. Any system with only cold planets is garbage. In fact, ask enough players and you'll find that every possible star system ever formed by the laws of physics is it's still garbage. garbage. Colonize them any Anyway, because I like the animation that plays each time you do so. There's uh -huh. actually an animation for every type of planet, which I didn't know because who the fuck colonizes a gas giant as their first choice of planet? Because gas giants are pretty freaking cool. In terms of mechanics, they are the ones that can, well, protect the rest of the other planets. They may not be the likes that you can establish yeah, that actually doesn't make any sense. Like, in terms of using it to, just to own one is good. That, that, that's why I'm going to leave it. Like, just like a big brother Jupiter, that it's tanking most of our, like, the asteroid that comes our way. So, big bro Jupiter. <laughs> it's like, where are we dropping, boys? Oh, oh yeah, on the burning gas giant. H how are we meant to walk on a gas giant? Very carefully. <laughs> anyway, I'm losing track. You choose a star system, and you pick a more reasonable type of planet to be the base of your colony. Most factions can't settle a system immediately. They need to form an outpost, send colony support, and convince any other players contesting the system to cease their aggressive expansionism. You can do this through liberal policies, such as stealing their food supplies, or less liberal policies, also known as an interplanetary blockade, with a sole purpose of starving them to death. Typically, this is how you greet other players. Wow. You blast their ships out of orbit, and you get sent a formal complaint, to which you respond accordingly. Diplomacy is an interesting concept. Uh, we do have other things to take care of. These are diplomatic channels, not social media. Again? Are you just lonely? Because <laughs> unlike many games of a similar nature... Oh, oh, civilization, my dude. Evil Gandhi? Man. Diplomacy is a tangible resource. In fact, everything is a resource. If you want to condense down the Endless Space 2 experience, you're going to be spending hours of your life trying to increase the five colors. Green, orange, yellow, blue, and purple. Respectively, these are food, industry, <laughs> dust, Giga science, Chad. and influence. Or FIDSI for short. These are the combined economic outputs of your systems. At the beginning, you don't have very much. You can't do very much. So you need more. A lot more. You need food to grow population. Population contributes 
contributes to the economy and gives you different bonuses depending on the race of that population. But right. a planet's base output is pathetic, so you need to build... Quick question. Let's go back to that race just for a little bit. I do not know their names, but... How in the fuck do you sleep? Bro! Look at his head! <laughs> ah, look, look at the, the top, top of, of his, his head! head. <laughs> <laughs> that has got to leave you with a lot of neck aches. Like, I'm, I'm not the only one seeing this, am I? Depending on the race of that population, but a <clears throat> base output is pathetic, so you need to build improvements. To do that, you need industry. More industry, more production. But you can't have industry without research, and you can't have research without science. Besides unique variations, every faction follows the same unified tech tree. Supporting larger industry requires dust, a lot of dust. And if you're planning to go to war, exponentially more dust. To even make the formal declaration that you're going to erase someone off the face of the galaxy, Galaxy, you need influence. It is the most precious resource and represents your combined yeah. political power. Well, the too. bigger your influence, the bigger your sphere of influence. This game doesn't work on national borders. <laughs> it works on raw intergalactic peer pressure. Have enough <laughs> influence and you'll absorb everyone without even lifting a finger. Besides other players, there are also minor factions. Did you know the Nigerians govern a sector of space occupied by several different humanoid species? If we say yes, will you feed us? <laughs> One of those species is the They occupy just ten percent of Nigerian space, but take up nearly eighty percent of the space in Nigerian prisons. Maybe they commit. Wow, I didn't know it back then. The Star Trek actually had like a focus on the prison system. That's uh, that's a nice callback. More crimes. These are civilizations that are advanced, yet not advanced enough to avoid a simulation. These are very diverse and can be anything from sentient jellyfish, reformed assassin droids looking for God, or even <laughs> chunks of coral reef remotely piloted by a sentient supercomputer the size of a planet, which in itself was formed by random chance. Minor factions exist to be absorbed by other players. Why? Simulate. Because you get a free system out of it and a unique racial trait. Never underestimate these because a single good trait can win you the game. There's also pirates. It's okay. Everybody finds me irresistible. <laughs> Dude, you look like Tom Kench. Exist to occupy every system you ever like and reduce the overall quality of your time and space. Luckily, pirates are business oriented and will not trouble you as long as you pay. Also, I like putting pirate marks on all of my friends' colonies. Consider it an indirect way of saying maybe you should move. Now you've got the basics down. What are you meant to do? You're meant to try and you're meant to fail. Endless Space 2 gives you freedom. Freedom to fuck up and suffer the consequences. The tech tree is subdivided into four distinct categories military Jeez. economy science and empire develop your military and you get bigger guns but you don't get the ships to mount them you need to develop your empire for that then you need a military industrial complex to facilitate the production of i'm sorry like i i am currently going through a phase of attempting to be an elf wait a minute how wait first of all you're not gonna speed past that like you didn't just say what you just said i know exactly how that sounded hear me out i am currently playing total warhammer 2 and playing the different elven factions and i thought that the micromanaging in that game was difficult nah it doesn't seem like it this one is intense of your armada, which forces you to tech economy, not only for developing your systems, but for supplying a constant stream of dust, because bankruptcy is not an option. For reference, one technology unlock is the difference between abject poverty and having the largest intergalactic <laughs> trade company incorporated on your home system. Why stop there? Get access to the galactic commodities market as well, because it's a biological requirement for me to speculate the stock market in every game I play. Do all that and realize you neglected science which is a problem because every single research you ever research makes every following research more expensive yeah to research endless space 2 is a great galactic scale balancing act every action taken is counterbalanced by the opportunity cost of every action not taken here's an example let's say you found a nice system but you can't colonize it because each type of planet requires the respective technology to touch ground on their surface sure. you might spend a bunch of turns testing 
teching towards that. As a result, you get a new system. However, your lack of tech leaves you oblivious to the contents. You later find out that ideal Mediterranean planet you picked is filled with dinosaurs, the water is made of mercury, and the atmosphere gives you cancer. <laughs> Ninja! Sure. If you pumped everything into science and exploration, you would have found a much better system nearby. Because you explored the curiosities, you know there's plenty of strategic deposits without the risk of melanoma. Even the worst colony has great potential. Given a development plan, systems can compensate for deficiency using luxury. Low birth rate, spike the water with red sang. No production, use jadonics. Do people still keep using the term war criminal in your presence? Mm -hmm. Despite the fact you've clarified multiple times that enemy <laughs> civilians are indeed active combatants bring out the hallucinogenic grapes given time any problem can be solved given wow. money any problem can be solved instantaneously i don't know exactly how we're going to terraform a planet in a single turn but i know the <laughs> next time it. i look there better be a fucking jungle <laughs> instead there's a lot of ships in this game unique to each faction they have got capital optimizable, limited only by the type and number of modules available primarily yeah, beautiful in design to intimidate your enemies into submission and to intimidate your friends into working a little harder on their friendship your only <laughs> control over combat is the loadout formation and tactics used by your military the rest is a simulation played out by the computer where each time a ship explodes you know the cinematic at the end of diablo 2 where <laughs> Tyrael throws his sword at the world stone and it explodes into a billion chunks of wood yeah that's exactly how everything <laughs> explodes in this game combat is very simple there's different weapons which have different accuracies depending on the range of engagement. Flat cannons tread anything up close, including long range Oof. ballistic missiles, but they bounce off armor. Lasers cut ships in half at mid range, while beam weaponry works at every range. Unless they have shields, you can absolutely get away with filling every slot with a flat cannon, choosing the default tactics card, and still win every fight. Besides interplanetary combat, you can also directly invade. This works on the same principle, which means I'm still going to use the default tactics card which uh, just so happens to be preemptive orbital bombardment many okay exterminators nuke for orbit willing to make your chance of success depends entirely on whether or not you have replaced your troops with a mobile suit gundam if you conquer a system you can choose to either spare the population or take a massive hit to your public approval rating by re-educating and reintegrating the native population mm -hmm. into the fucking soil which is a good thing <laughs> to talk about politics in endless space too you have government you have senate and you have an obligation to represent your people which is why we have a dictatorship power to the masses is power to the upper classes and any proletariat will see the wisdom of my words politics <laughs> is all encompassing in endless space too any action you take endorse or sponsor will shift the political axis of your entire empire as with real life the opinions of your people are difficult to manage their motivations difficult to guess there's a total of six different party ideologies you can choose to support each two a pair of polar opposites <laughs> religious and scientific militarist and pacifist ecological and industrial on top of that you've got your government this controls your party representation and how much corruption you can get away with that's crazy how they they, they literally force you to choose either ones but like there should be a mixture of every because you can't live without, like truly, without any of the others because of your people. But again, I mean, like endless space, just like in Warhammer 40k, I think that the word democracy has been removed from the annals of the people uh, or so-called empires a long time ago. With democracy has the widest free party representation. It is also the most corrupt because uh -huh. I have no control over my elections. Okay. Republics and federations are generally more progressive, offering less representation and more opportunities to correct the result of any rigged election. Dictatorship completely removes the need for underhanded tactics and ensures that all voices are heard and represented by the single party I choose. Every political party of holding office office has representatives. These are not your average man. These are heroes recruited from the academy. But what is the academy? You know how yeah. I said dust is currency and mm -hmm. dust is essentially a cloud computing nanite swarm? Now, 
Imagine smoking it because the Academy does exactly that. What? Hiring nanite augmented crackheads to rule your empire. These are very diverse in both race and specialization. They each have their own unique and interesting backstory. Except cool. Scales. Scales is literally a giant bat that likes to eat zucchini. <laughs> I would have compared. Uh, I would have compared it to uh, spices from Dune, but okay, nanites are good enough. How is she qualified in any way to be my senator? I, I don't know. But the people, the people love her, and who am I to say no to that smile? So what's the point of She's political got the parties? Nonas. I'll tell you. It's called legislation, and legislation controls the focus of your empire. You can pass laws respective to each party you have in office. The leading political party also enacts their own automatic policy. Scientists let you research high tech without unlocking it. Religion gives you the moral high ground to escalate a cold war without legal consequence. Industrialism uses the economy to finance the economy by expanding the economy. How could <laughs> ecology possibly compete? Well, by giving the public announcement that we don't exactly know how to live on a volcano. So... <laughs> Let's do it anyway. Militarist <laughs> rhetoric not only removes the political cost of war, it actively encourages you to go to war of with course. absolutely everyone. <laughs> and finally, the pacifists can, at any time, without your consent, force you into a state of peace. Passing a law costs influence, depending on the size of your empire. The longer a party stays in power, the more laws you have to choose from. For example, state-enforced eugenics and mandatory sterilization of other races who aren't your own is a relatively simple law to pass with minimal political experience. What? Uh, somebody just in the office was like, hey, you know, we, we have options. We have choices. Asking everyone to work overtime requires a level of finesse and eloquence only seen in the most Machiavellian of politicians. Mm -hmm. Unlike many 4X games, Endless Space 2 has quests. Most of these are faction-specific story missions with branching political options to suit your empire. They're quite interesting, they give you something to do, and most of all, they give you permanent upgrades for the rest of the game. You okay. also have multiplayer. How do you play multiplayer? It's quite simple. You all connect to a game, you play for about 50 turns, you forget to make backups of your game, and then everyone collectively desynchronizes. Welcome to Endless Space 2 Multiplayer. With all that covered, you've got a general idea of how to play Endless Space 2. Now, let's get to the fun stuff, the factions. There are currently 12 different races to choose. I'm gonna cover them all. The Sophons are a race of intellectuals. Despite this, they talk in a British accent. They're overdeveloped geckos that love science and hate personal health and safety. The less people <laughs> know a technology, the faster Sophons can obtain it. If you want a fairly vanilla faction with an easy science victory, go play the Sophonity. Conversely, Sorry, Link. I can't give credit. Come back when you're a little... Mm, richer. We have a Lumeris, whose entire ethos, motivation, and philosophy can be crystallized in one word. Money. For the Lumeris, no Moolah. problem is too great, as long as you throw piles of money at it. They also have my favorite faction leader. Commerce, baby. I wonder why. I can see two reasons, at least. The lifeblood of this and any other galaxy. What to say for? Responsible for every single trade cartel in the known galaxy, and arguably runs more of an economic crime syndicate than a legitimate empire. <laughs> but. I don't care, because Big Titty Fish Mommy is going to buy the galaxy, and I'm going to help her. If you like obscene <laughs> amounts of cash, amphibious mommy milkers, or just winning the game by accident, play Lumeris. Imagine rampant over-industrialization and the fractured ecosystem that follows. Given such dire conditions, what do you think is the most reasonable course of action? You can A, put all your resources into ecological initiatives and repair the sorry state of your planet, <laughs> or B, digitize yourself and become a gaming laptop. The Vodiani chose the second option. Laptop Even better, course. they made a church out of it. Belief is strength. Worship is endless. And heretics are nothing but essence for the harvest. Unlike other races, the Vodiani don't colonize. Bro, I gotta say, they remind me a lot of uh, the, um, uh, no, no, not the Goa'uld from Stargate. I was kind of thinking about them, but th those are kind of like viruses because of the worms that they would put into you. But like, the aesthetic-wise, in the way that they travel and such, 
like how they incorporated tech into like somewhat humanoid looking bodies. Oh, that's nice design. I love it. They travel, they land, and then they harvest. Then we have Horatio. Come to pry on the most stunning man in the galaxy again. I'll say it again, just once more. Look at the, the top, top of his head! <laughs> Originally a wealthy trillionaire, Horatio set out to find his own star system. Along the way, he also found extremely advanced cloning technology. So he made a billion copies of the most beautiful and gorgeous person to ever exist, which was of course Horatio. Himself. And then Horatio thought to himself, what better than to fill the galaxy with beauty? What better than- Horatio is a top level narcissist. Jeez. To fill the galaxy, with Horatio. Horatio is concerned with pressing matters such as air conditioning. His government, accordingly, is an eco-fascist dictatorship. Oh, he's an eco-fascist? Great again. Of course, there are other, less fortunate races. Jesus Christ. What's the ratio of Horatio in the ratio? <laughs> Yo, Doug. And Horatio. But Horatio is not only handsome, he is also brilliant. And thus, he finds ways to integrate minority populations by splicing their genetics with Horatio. Yes, many of your less symmetrical friends and family may simply disappear, but know that their memory will live on inside Horatio. Horatio is a classic case of careful who you call ugly in high school because he just might use the entire galaxy as a glorified eugenics program. The United Empire can be summarized in a single clip. I'm doing my part. <laughs> yeah. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. Battles of first. Love this movie. The United Empire is an imperialist expansionist federation where the will of the emperor is absolute. Any construction, any technology, any luxury he so desires, the empire provides. For the emperor Oof. does not ask, he commands. And the raw influence of his voice can make the impossible into reality. If you want to play not only the most industrious faction, but also mm -hmm. the one that generates the most influence just by being industrious, try <laughs> the United Empire. Propaganda, patriotism, and the greatest of military industrial complexes. Yeah. Of Enlist today, service guarantees citizenship. So far, everyone I covered at least have the option of diplomacy. But what if that's just not in your nature. What do you sound like when you scream? The Cravers are fucking terrifying. As a leftover yeah. body weapon made by the Virtual Endless, they only have one purpose. Consume everything. Any planet with Search and destroy. has a fixed life expectancy. Because the Cravers will rip it, strip it, and tear it apart. And then they move on. There is no long-term plan. There is no sustainability. There is no choice but to consume you as well. We are coming. Trees. Do you know how fast a tree moves? Not very fast. The Unfallen are a race of trees. They speak huh? with a Scottish accent. Why do you pester the heart with your petty needs? <laughs> why? Oh, I know why. That's a stupid question. Uh, the, uh, what's the name again? The Druid? The, the Druid in the old, uh... In the old Viking tales, at least those who were involved with the, uh, it's both Northern Ireland and also Scotland. They always had, like, a, a nature theme. It's all part of the old Celtic politism and such. It's, it's a long story. Much like the Scottish, trees are rooted to the ground. They don't do much, and their only way of winning the game is to ask you politely. Do you know how they colonize other planets? They need to slowly, delicately, without interruption, entwine them with celestial vines and hope or pray that they didn't start next to Cravers. If you enjoy <laughs> pressing and turn and being a vegetable, you'll enjoy playing the Unfallen. Imagine being an ostrich. Now, imagine evolving to the point where you're used as arena blood sports for the 
entertainment of an advanced decadent civilization. All right. That civilization gets wiped out. You get your freedom and form a tribalistic society of samurai ostriches. <laughs> then you accidentally stab your katana through a giant ship and suddenly you're a major faction. The Hisha were added with the Supremacy DLC together with the main source of tears and salt on the Endless Space 2 <laughs> Bayamoths. Bayamoths are multi-purpose capital class ships. They can support the bureaucracy, plutocracy, or theocracy, accelerate genocide, accommodate homicide, extract resources in a remote situation, and even terraform planets for improved habitation. They can do anything. That's why they're insanely expensive and you get very few of them. But oh. that's not why people got upset. They got upset because the Bayamoth is a precursor to something a little more concerning. A planet killer is morally dubious, leaves millions of grieving survivors, and generally causes public unrest. Mm -hmm. A system killer accelerates a megaton nuclear payload directly at the sun. That's what I meant. Like we have in Warhammer 40k the thing called a Staminatus. Pretty self-explanatory when somebody decides to take a bit of extreme measures to get rid of a problem because you know, is there a planetary infestation? Exterminatus. Has there been conspiracies of heresy? Exterminatus. Too many degenerate reading Japanese. Exterminatus. Strategic value absolute. They do that. But here in endless space, we go straight for the stars. <laughs> Star killer. Wow. And as Alpha mentioned, if you hit a blue giant like that. You get more than just a supernova. But with a thousand to more times the power of that of a normal sun, it's frightening. Causing it to expand into a red supergiant as the core collapses and begins to fuse hydrogen. In a single nanosecond, all life in that solar system is gonna need some SPF 70 sunscreen. <laughs> the Obliterator is a system killer which is made by upgrading a Bayamoth. And prior to many updates and patches had no effect on public relations. I found this <laughs> incredibly entertaining. Because the missile actually has to travel to its destination, it often took several turns for enemy players to see the ball of light quickly approaching their home system. At this point, you will notice something. The chat functionality, inside which you will see a stream of colorful messages <laughs> calling you a number of racial slurs, after which the player will mysteriously disconnect and add you as a friend on Steam, even after numerous <laughs> notes that he show stand tall. For the he show, combat isn't just about winning, it's about honor, which they call Kai because they're a race of weeaboo samurai chickens. The more honorable <laughs> your actions, the more Kai you generate, the more obedient your empire. And if it ever falls too low, just remember, Aztec blood sacrifices are a great way of gaining popularity. Vaulters what? They commit Sudoku as well? I know it's Sebaku, but Jesus. <laughs> race designed to completely invalidate the Sophons, because for vaulters, location is no issue. We've got portals for that. Disconnected system with no clear star lane? Even better. The typical vaulter player will usually fuck off to the four corners of the galaxy and quietly win a science victory before we can even find them. Also, Yo. their mothership, the Argosi, can be used as a two-way portal. I very much enjoy parking outside an enemy system, warping in my obliterator, and cooking them instantaneously. <laughs> the Riftborn are Tetris blocks from another universe, which is currently overrun with super aids. In a last act of desperation, the Riftborn entered our universe. To them, it's a dystopian reality filled with all manner of squirming, wriggling creatures that piss and shit everywhere. From their perspective, they just took a one-way ticket to hell. However, <laughs> they don't judge. They just want to survive. Unlike us, Riftborn aren't born. They're made in the construction queue. Otherwise, they work a lot like us. Except, in reverse, terrestrial planet, I sleep. Thousand degree lava planet with no trace of life, real shit. Call it <laughs> immediately. Hey, it's a race of abstract geometric polygons. They are freaking aesthetic, my dude. Give them a break. Luckily, they can also break reality by compressing or dilating the flow of time. And if you've ever been to a college fraternity, you'll have no problem pronouncing their names. The second last <laughs> DLC, Penumbra, introduced a controversial mechanic. 
hacking. It's a nice way to grab intel, sabotage enemy systems, and of course, accidentally turn a Craver government into a pacifist dictator. <laughs> they also added nice. the Umbral Choir. The Umbral Choir is an immaterial, intergalactic wraith with good intentions. Like a ghost in the machine, the Umbral Choir spreads by hacking absolutely uh. everything. Every transmission is tapped. Every system is compromised. They perform the actual assimilation that is needed. Everything under one control. For the greater good. <laughs> and we have no trace of who did it. Because the Umbral Choir doesn't want to be found. How do you fight something you can't see? How do you stop something that's already inside the wire? And if it's already inside the wire, then... <sighs> How do you know it isn't inside you already? Honestly, they're extremely fun to play, especially when your friends mouse over a system and ask why half of their GDP keeps disappearing into the Craver Pension Fund. Finally, it's a good time to talk about the last DLC, Awakening, which adds the Nakalim, a fairly interesting religious faction that okay. I personally enjoyed, but also adds the Academy as a separate AI-controlled faction. Now, wow. let me tell you why that's a problem. Can because have everybody. the leader of the academy, bear with me, I don't know how to pronounce his name, because it's... It's Yanda. What's that? Sandir takes territory, which he oh. doesn't need away from players. He can also enter your territory, destroy your fleets, and siege your planets. But, Lord forbid, you manage to... Is that like a take on Alexander the Great? Because I think in, in Turkish, his name is Iskandar. Or in Arabic. So... Alexander is Yander. Sink one of Isandir's ships, which, by the way, are stronger than any other faction. That's an act of aggression. And he's going to ask looks you freaking cool. to pay reparations. <laughs> Mal <Malfano, laughs> if you're getting harassed and abused by Isandir and you want him to stop, you can't. Until you discover the location of the academy, you can't even do diplomacy. Now, let's say you forgive all that. You're open-minded. And you're wondering, what's the point of a new academy? I am once again asking for your financial <laughs> support. Every 10 turns, Isandir will ask for your most generous financial contribution to the academy. The highest contributions will get their preferred position within the academy. After oh. another 10 turns, I am once again asking <laughs> for your financial support. Also, he's been expertly programmed to Is forget he any positive relations you had before, which may surprise you, since he'll go back to neutral and start attacking you. Better oh. pay up, because you can't contribute to the academy until you've paid. Yo, he's worst. That's Tom Nook. <laughs> Isn't it? That's absolutely it. This Yana comes knocking at your door like, hey, you gotta pay off right now. <coughs> or what I meant to say was... Paid reparations. If you try to take his home system, he'll demand you give it back and pay reparations. <laughs> Who the fuck made this shit? Oh, right. It's not even the same studio. They no. Sourced this. I'm from Buenos Aires and I say kill them all. Yeah. All the other DLC up until Penumbra. Fantastic. Love it. Awakening is about $13 you can spend to make the game worse. It's so <laughs> garbage that even if I got it for free, I'd still ask for a refund. We could talk after. <laughs> You should ask for reparations. <laughs> Strategy, metagame, oh. and the eternal <laughs> question we always return to. Is Endless Space 2 balanced? No, no, it is not. There are many mods to try and fix this, but ultimately, part of what makes this game so interesting is the element of randomness, forcing you to adapt and overcome the circumstances to the best of your ability. There's many players out there who will constantly demand you remake the game, citing that they don't have an optimal five-planet system adjacent to them and can't possibly compete. If you don't, they disconnect. The equivalent of this is being born on planet Earth to a middle-class family, and immediately committing suicide to try and re-roll for better RNG. Because if I can't be born as the son of a wealthy Middle Eastern sheik, I may as well not be born. <laughs> Endless Space 2 is a wonderfully designed and beautifully made game with such a level of pace and intrigue that I actually bought a legal copy. I've played it for two years and I still keep coming back. It satisfies every tick box I ever wanted for a civilized
civilization game in space. It's enjoyable and relaxing, both in single player and in multiplayer. You're probably going to desynchronize before anyone actually gets angry. <laughs> I like the music and I enjoy amphibious mommy milkers. Of I course. Space 2, an extremely high score. I am also issuing <laughs> a public fatwa against anyone responsible for the Awakening DLC. This time, there is no discount because my inside man had a talk with Sega. Their formal response? <laughs> Fuck <That's> you. <laughs> so I recommend waiting for a sale, buying on discount, or using other legal methods of purchase that I am not yet aware of. As always, more content to come, so stay tuned. I'm sorry for all the delays. Streaming really put me back. A warm thanks to the many members of the Merchants Guild, generously funding and bankrolling these videos. You're all truly wonderful. Take care and have a good one. Yo, I like how he has his very own department. Wait, is that Mandalore Games with him? And crawling these videos. You're all truly wonderful. Take care and have a good one. Yeah. Nice. I like to see a collab between those two. But yeah, people, this has been Endless Space 2's review from Seth. Jesus, this is a great game. Don't think that I'm going to be playing it though. It's just, there are just too many games at the moment. Do, do, do you feel that? I, I think that a couple of years ago, I felt like there was like a drought of things to, to, to play or to come around. But I think that I was just too very focused on certain genres that I didn't expand my horizons. Then I started to diving into RTS and such and then I started realizing there's so much, there's so much on the table. We have so many awesome stuff coming out this year and I'm looking forward to try at least some of the new releases in every genre. But with that said guys, thank you so much for checking out this video, it was amazing. As always, if you are not yet subscribed to Seth's channel, please go ahead and do that. Like the original video and watch this one as well as others that are on the channel right here. With that, I wish you all a wonderful day. See you guys next time. Bye.